Let's talk about peas. They are definitely a hero ingredient in my household. In this episode, I talk to the king of pea production in the UK, Stephen Francis of Fen Peas. Carry on listening if you want more. Hello, welcome to the Countryside Kitchen Meats, a food and farming podcast. I'm Millie Fife, your host. I'm a mum of two, farmer's wife, food producer and passionate about flying the flag for British food and farming. Today we'll be chatting to Stephen Francis, who is Managing Director of Fen Peas. Then I've got a few time-saving hacks when it comes to mealtime preparation and some recipes to share, meaning you can juggle family life with the children and cook a tasty, nutritious meal too. Okay, let me introduce you to my guest. Stephen Francis is a third generation pea grower from Lincolnshire. Stephen spent his childhood amongst acres of pea vines with one of his earliest memories of his grandfather overseeing the load of peas into railway carriages from the back of the canning factory in the late 60s. Today, Stephen manages Fen Peas Limited, which is a growing cooperative of 5,000 acres of peas in Lincolnshire with a grower base of around 82 farmer members who work together to reap the benefits of collective purchasing, best practice, sharing and manpower. I first met Stephen at an awards ceremony I had organised in the House of Lords, as you do, and I've been keen to find out more about the pea growing industry in the UK ever since because in my mind peas are a hero ingredient in all of my repertoire so without further ado let's chat to Stephen hello how are you Stephen hello Millie I'm fine how are you I'm all right thank you yeah yeah I'm so excited to talk about peas I was just about to say you look extremely excited to talk about (laughs) peas which please it pleases me greatly (laughs) And there are so many puns as well that we could kind of weave into this podcast interview. I think we we? Pro- we probably can and then have a competition to count them and sort of prize for somebody who's counted the most. Oh, the- <laughs> you're on. What 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 what's what's the uh, the the prize? Uh, a bag of frozen peas? Oh, I don't. I think we can do a bit better than that. We can find some goodies somewhere. I'm sure. Between. Oh, amazing, amazing! Right, you're on. Right, <laughs> how many <laughs> pea, pea puns can, <laughs> can we weave in? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, just tell me a little bit about your backstory. Obviously, I've just introduced you, and you've obviously peas obviously runs within your your family history. So, you know how how did you get involved in the pea industry? Well, from a very early age, um, as you said, my family had a uh, canning factory, Boston Kings Lynn, and I was born in the early 60s. My grandfather had sort of very, I suppose at the time, still Victorian ways, and I was the first grandchild born. The hospital I was born in was across the river from the factory, and so when it was time to go home, he insisted that I was brought to the factory first. So I actually was in the factory before I went home into my crib to begin my life. So they say peas are in my DNA from that stage. <laughs> um, and I, I suppose thinking about you have a fairly normal childhood, I had a child as everybody does, but then when the summer came and uh, you needed to earn a bit of money uh, as a student um first of all when we were very young we used to go hand picking peas at a place local to boston a few friends of ours and we were very glad to get our one pound 50 at the end of the day which doesn't sound a lot now but i can assure you it was a lot then and then i started pea sampling which i did in 1980 for fem peas and it sort of evolved around there, really. It just got bigger and bigger. We did have a family farm, but I felt I didn't really want to be tied to the farm totally. So I wanted to spread my wings. And at the time, Fempies was 400, 500 acres. And we were given, or I was given a remit to grow it. And we sort of grew it organically. Uh, if anybody came along, we took them on. And yeah, from the humble beginnings, the company itself was founded in 1968 and we are the longest remaining cooperative in its original state for peas in the UK, which is quite a proud fact. But yeah, from a humble four members for a start, we're now, as you said earlier, 82. 
And yeah, that's about it, really. It's no year's the same. You can't get bored of it. We've got the challenges of the weather this year, as we have every year. And yeah, it's a unique thing to be in. But um, yeah, I love it. Yeah, and and you can tell from the passion in your voice as well. It's 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 it it fascinates me so much, and it's just something I, you know the whole this whole story and the P story is something I wanted to share with the listeners because I think you know it, it's something that perhaps a lot of people take for granted that you know you've got a bag of frozen peas in the freezer and you don't necessarily think about the journey or you know what goes on behind the scenes in terms of um the production and the cooperative and everyone joining together um to be able to obviously pull resources how many grow at pea grow obviously there are 82 within your cooperative how many pea growers are there in the in the uk and is it you know is it quite localized right good question um the uk is the largest producer of frozen peas in northern europe producing some 130,000 tons a year in terms of the number of pea growers themselves i'm just going to say hundreds mm. uh, because i know there's another pea group got a couple of hundred um, but if we look at it in terms of groups and people actually doing it there are 15 of us one five in mm. the uk the most southerly of those is in Suffolk, and then you come up into Norfolk and into Lincolnshire, which is a big heartland all through Lincolnshire, South Yorkshire, East Yorkshire, then a big jump to the Scottish borders, which has got some very good land, and then a large area in the Dundee Basin. There's a factory up there. And if your geography is really good, you can tell that that is all on the eastern seaboard. They yeah. please love this maritime climate. Um, and so, yeah, all the peas in the UK grown on the eastern seaboard. Years ago, there were peas grown in central England, Worcester and various other places. But, yeah, the home of peas is the east coast, really, where the soil suitable, you know, for them to be put into the ground. So, yeah, there's 15 of us. We never see ourselves in competition. We know each other very well. Um, and whilst there are some things that are commercially sensitive, <clears throat> within an industry we as ourselves cooperate we cooperate with the research through really um process of growers research organization pgro so we set the research we require and health and safety which is a key factor in any business we meet two or three times a year to discuss health and safety matters and you know unlike probably any other industry there's a huge sharing of open information um, and it works very well you know yeah. if we've got a problem somebody we can ring the pick up the phone and somebody else has probably got the same problem there's a lot of shared information because sometimes you can feel in a bubble on your own so the network involved in the pea industry is tight but it's open and communicates a lot yeah, that's really positive as well, because what you don't want to do is, you know, be sort of catty and kind of climbing over each other for the, you know, the best profits or, you know, I've grown the, got the best yield or, you know, I'm sure there's probably, you know, round a bar, you probably joke about, oh, you're doing better than me, you know, like the farmer yields and things you hear in the pub. But, you know, just to kind of work more in collaboration is, you know, surely it is safety in numbers, it's strength in numbers and, uh it could only be a positive, can't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. And it's quite interesting to say about yield. But each year, for instance, last year, where we sit very close to Boston, our silt lands and being close to the coast, despite the dryness of it, our yields were good. Mm -hmm. um, and we were very close to producing budget, despite it being the hottest year on record for a number of years. North and south of us, suffered badly and um, they didn't yield as well but having said that if I think of 2012 and 2007 when it was extremely wet we suffered badly because we're low-lying land the, you know drains were full the water couldn't get away and other areas um, that have got better drainage uh, natural drainage they did very well so you know you take these things over a five-year average and hopefully we can return a bit of money to the growers. Yeah, yeah. And is there is there a certain variety that grow that you you know, or do you mix it up every year? Or you know, I do, I don't know with the in the pea world 
so how right, that works. The, there are a lot of varieties and uh, i personally grow 14 varieties and the first variety i put in the ground has got a uh a zero oh, sort of i'm trying to think of the best way to explain this um so at harvest if we call it zero so it requires so many heat units to get to that harvest point which is the difference between max and min on a daily basis so the variety i drill after that is probably what we say we call plus two so if they're drilled on the same day mm they will mature two days later and so it goes on like that so you have a spread through your drilling program which you know is what we need because we are even now making plans for our 2024 crop so what we're producing this year might be jumping about here a bit um what we're producing this year is obviously available to the consumer from june onwards and probably runs through to june july next year yeah so that's 2024 and we're now thinking about what the seed crops how they've gone into the ground how they might fare this year that we need to put into the ground in 2024 to take us through to the middle of 2025 so it's quite an ongoing forward thinking process yeah and then to go back to your question variety so i have 14 varieties all maturing on different days I have different soil types. Also, the nearer I am to the coast, because it's cooler, they mature slower. So you have to put all these factors in, because ultimately when we start harvesting, we want to start and go 24 hours a day, seven days a week for seven, eight weeks without stopping. Because yeah. it's efficient for us, it's efficient for the factory. And the other thing is, Obviously, the further you go up the country, they can drill later. But, you know, you get to the middle of June and then you're beginning to lose daylight hours once yeah. you pass midsummer's day. So the maturity can slow down. And if you get a very cloudy, dark July, we like to finish by 10th of August. You know, you can drift well into August. And in some instances, some groups have drifted in September and the bloody things don't mature. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's this there's this magic mystical date of the seventh of April. I was reading about like what 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 is the significance of that day? Well, I I don't know. Yeah, interesting. Um, <laughs> I was told in my early days that um, you know that is the prime time for drilling. You always get the best crops, and I suppose years and years ago, I know we had seventy five, seventy six unusual weather patterns, but when we actually got a winter, spring, summer, and autumn, which we don't seem to get nowadays, and we know why, it seemed to be about the seventh of April. The peas drilled on that day produced the best yields. Interestingly. Uh, we're all aware of what the spring's been like this year. So we've basically lost a month this year. And what we're doing today are like uh, April conditions. May has turned into April because we're normally hunting for moisture to put the peas in the ground at this time of year. And I said to a grower this morning, I said, actually, this time, at this moment in time in May, we are drilling in probably the most perfect conditions which we would have expected a month ago. Mm. But, you know, we won't get political or whatever, but that's climate change. And, yeah. you know, we're aware of it, we're dealing with it. And, you know, I suppose while we're on it, the attributes and benefits of peas, they are one of the most sustainable crops to grow because they produce their own fertiliser. Yeah. So... Yeah, they take nothing out of the soil, rather the reverse, they leave nitrogen in the soil for the following crop. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And so just talk to us about, um, so obviously plant establishing the crop um, and how, you know, because it's something that always fascinates me because I grow peas in my garden and obviously, you know, you get all the little tendrils and they need to cling on to things. You know, obviously you're going into a field with a tractor with a drill, presumably, getting the crop established. What happens from there? Well, hopefully they emerge quite quickly. We keep the pigeons off. Um, how, how do you keep the pigeons with with um the um? We've got the word. It, it, people do various things. I mean, mm. sometimes yes, they will be shot. It's inevitable. Some mm. will. Um, and where we've got quite a few peas in a place, the farmers will get together because they're tricky little buggers to deal with. <laughs> um, and they'll have a day when they're shooting and keep moving them about, and hopefully moves them onto vegetable crops that mm. uh, don't affect us. 
Um, the other thing that we can use now just to keep disturbing them is um, lasers mm -hmm. that will go probably, you can get different ones, but the one I have is two kilometers. So you can sit on the side of the field just for 20 minutes or so and keep moving them on until they get absolutely fed up with it and they leave the telephone wires, fly off and go elsewhere. But yeah, pigeons, pigeon control is a cost, mm. a real cost, mm. uh, because once they are in, they are in. So mm. what we want is we want fast growth so that the peas will cover the ground so there's no bare land for the pigeons to land on. And then, yeah, the peas grow away. They grow away in order. And then they seem as though peas are strange. They grow slowly for a start, really. And then all of a sudden, once they get close to flowering, they gain a lot of height and the leaves get much bigger and they're absorbing all that sunlight. At that point, they're a bit susceptible to aphids. So it's often the case that we go through with an aphicide, pea moth as well, perhaps. And I'm quite an advocate of keeping the plant healthy, a bit like a human being. If the diet's good, they'll fight their own battles. So we use manganese, we use phosphite to keep them healthy, keep them going. Mm. And then once the peas mature, that's a significant benchmark. Um, and harvest is usually four weeks after that. And as we sit here now today, I've had peas in flower 10 days, two weeks. So mm. I'm looking probably this year at around about the 10th to the 12th of June, start harvesting, which is the same as last year, but nevertheless is earlier than normal, which is unusual given the wet weather and the cloudy weather we've had. But the crop forecast that we have was accurate last year, so I've no reason to believe it's not going to be this year. Mm. So preparations now are underway for the harvest, and the men are being warmed up, so they've got to get all their housework done or whatever they want to get done before they come and give me seven weeks of their lives yeah 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 and then and then the pea harvesters are they're big pieces of kit aren't they that go into the field and then the crop it it has to be go from field to frozen very very quickly doesn't it yeah it does the harvesters yeah large we run harvesters that come from holland They've got wide tracks on, they've got one metre tracks on so that the compaction's low. They're very efficient these days in terms of fuel and everything. And to the naked eye, they look brutal. They really do. But they are the softest kind of things that you could imagine to shell peas out of the pod. So in terms of your comment there about the speed of it, so once the first pea has been harvested from a load, we generally, not all peas in the UK, because there's a wide market, but a lot of the peas in the UK need to be frozen un in under 150 minutes. So that means that we've got to be on the ball with everything. It's, it's like a military operation. The timings are critical. A lot of things nowadays, especially loading into the factory, are done electronically. So there's no paperwork, but it's all done via an iPad. And we know we will tell the factory when the lorry is left. They will know it's on the way. We can then track the lorry because we know when it's been on the way bridge, when it started tipping, when it's backed up, you know, back on the way bridge and coming back to us. Uh, and it's just being aware of like traffic situation. So, mm -hmm. you know, on the East Coast here, when we get into the school holidays, Friday afternoons, people going up to Skegness or on the across to Norfolk, absolute nightmare mm. so we manage things like that by if we need a hygiene or a wash down probably do it in that busy period but obviously overnight running 24 hours we like to think that after seven o'clock at night we've got a free run until nine o'clock the next morning so yeah. like a military operation the reason the 150 minute is it was been developed over a number of years but it's felt that that is the timing that make sure we retain all the nutrients and the freshness of peas and to liken it to something if you think of a banana once you've peeled the skin on a banana and put it on the side you go back to it 20 minutes later it is starting to go off the enzymes are reacting and it's no different to a pea if it's in the pod you could take a pea pod in the morning 
out the field, take it home and have it for your tea. And if you left it in the pod, it would still be succulent inside. But as soon as you open that pod, that's it. You know, deterioration, that's probably the wrong word because uh, we are harvesting to stop that, you know, quickly to stop them deteriorating. But yeah, as the process takes place and they are going further towards maturity, so we've got to get them frozen quickly. And so where do they then get they obviously go to the factory for freezing but who who are your main customers is it retail is it catering is it in the uk is it abroad yeah so my main customer is um green yard frozen foods uk who have a factory here in boston which is very close to our growing base and one in king's lynn and in the main they are going to retail so own label so, you know whichever supermarket is they deal with most of them um so that Retail accounts for about 80% of the UK market with food service, as we call it, which is restaurants, catering, further manufacturing. Um, they account for 20%, which is a good thing because nobody, however clever they think they are, will never get it perfect each year. We will not achieve all our peas at the correct grade, but there is a market for older peas, so for let's say even D-grade peas, you would not believe how many the pet food market require. And if you, you've probably got dogs, when you open up a pouch, you can see peas in there. They will be the older peas. Um, ready meals, they need older peas because long cooking under pressure, if you've got a young pea, it will just explode and lose its shape. Whereas if they use older peas, they've still got the flavour but they've still also keep their form within yeah. the um, meal that you're serving. So, but it was interesting, uh, you know, you opened up when you, you actually mentioned the word ingredients and that's been a big shift that in consumer habits, rather than being on the side of a plate, more and more people are using them as an ingredient. So they may cook a curry at home or if they buy one in, they might, might want to brighten it up, sprinkle some peas on the top, stir them in and they're absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you're totally right. And I mean, I, you know, obviously I, I cook something like steak and chips and peas. But then uh, even last night I did a pasta dish and I always put some peas through it because kids love them. And, you know, it's it's really healthy. They're really good for you. Um, and it sort of counts as one of your five a day, doesn't it? Well, it does. And it is so simple. And the other thing, never mind, you know, that we're in the cost of living crisis that we find ourselves in. But there's no waste you can pour there's no preparation um people are time short still time short uh, there's no preparation you can pour out as many peas as you want and therefore you should have no waste you yeah. know you should eat everything and i think generally we're seeing you know retailers are reporting as our processors that there are more people dipping into the frozen chest in the supermarket be because of that reason it's like cauliflower some people couple the cauliflower is too big for them to eat and they waste it whereas if they buy frozen equally as good and they can just take out how many frets they want it's yeah. the same with peas all frozen vegetables yeah so. yeah no, i'm a huge advocate of that too because like you say the food <clears> waste <throat> you, you just use what you need um and you haven't got sort of a you know a half manky cauliflower hanging about in the bottom of your fridge which actually you know if it's been in there a week or two it's probably not very nutritionally you know uh good for you yeah, <laughs> it's, not. Uh, it's but... like we said about you know the, the banana scenario like cauliflower as soon as you cut it off at the bottom if it's in its whole head and leaf and everything, it will keep a long time. But if you start delving into it and cutting florets off to eat and then think, I'll have that a day or two later, as you say, the deterioration has increased because you've in effect blistered the product further around and there's more places for air and everything to get in. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of pea promotion, obviously, um, I've heard about the, the Yes Peas campaign um, and that runs throughout July, basically highlighting peas. Is that right? Well, it runs 12 months a year. Yes. Um, and to give it a bit of a backstory, I think we've been going about 15 years and it started. It's self-funded by the industry, not a big budget, but 15, 20 years ago, Harvester Restaurants, I think it was at the time, was saying we're not going to we're going to stop sending peas out because we're getting them all back. They're rubbish, mm. so people are eating them. So 
when we looked into it, they were obviously in that industry buying the cheapest that they could and they were buying the worst. And just for another two or three pence a kilo, they could have much better quality peas. And so we sort of, um, it, yeah, the campaign was formed on the back of that and it went in in quietly. We were feeling our way into this promotional thing and the company were employed in Lincolnshire were as well. And then we had, in 2007, we were asked to take a pea vine at the Lord Mayor's show, um, which we did, gladly. Drove it around there, and we really targeted a lot of promotion then. And we thought, wow, you know, there's something here that people are interested in and they want to know, because the general public came to look at the machine that day. Uh, we found that, you know, the hits that were on our websites and various things and the demand. So then the campaign sort of went up a step and as social social media in 2007 was there, but not as great as it mm. is now. And so with social media, yeah, we now have a campaign that's active 12 months a year. The biggest part of it is obviously, as you say, our Great British Pee Week, which this year is from the 3rd to the 9th of July. We had a chat about it with hatch communications who do the work for us earlier in the week so we're well on with that yeah but the other thing we do also is when it something comes along we can tap into any of these 15 of us who want to to respond to something that's gone on in the press and mm. for my i think yeah it was two years ago there was a study done in america that said peas shouldn't be far, one of your five a day because mm -hmm. they're not nutritious. And so I get a phone call from a television company and they say, what do you say to that? I said, well, it's absolute rubbish. I said, <laughs> well, do you want to say that on telly? I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm happy about that. Mm -hmm. So then he said he was from this morning. And um, so the next day we were on, um, this was during COVID actually, we were on, this morning with Holly Willoughby and Phil Schofield. And yeah. interestingly, Piers Morgan was the previous person being interviewed. And he was being interviewed about the COVID vaccination. And at the end of his bit, Philip Schofield or Holly Willoughby said, you know, OK, thank you very much, Piers. Um, next, we've got peas. We're talking about peas because some people think they're not very good. And, da, da, da. and uh, what's your view on peas? And Piers Morgan went, just like the COVID vaccination, peas should be mandatory. Yeah. And so, you know, you get odd things like that that help you along the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we often get a request, or the industry does, for people to come out and film the process because it is quite exciting. And just to see what goes into it. And also there's the wow factor. We've had Blue Peter. We had Radzi from Blue Peter come and... Yeah that one keeps getting shown actually i'm told um and the children are fascinated with it you know oh, all yeah uh, and also quite interesting when you get into promotion that the language that you use i should have asked you who this is going out to because the language that you use to explain something differs from the general public to a seven-year-old yeah. or whichever market you're going at so it's quite interesting it is a bit of a can be a bit of a distraction at harvest but nevertheless like last year great british pee week we had schools visit a field of ours and obviously with safety child safety in particular at the moment there were lots of hoops to go through but we got a bus locally that i don't know i think it was a 50 seater and it just kept it brought a load of children. Then it went around and fetched the next, next load. So half an hour later, another load of children turn up. And it yeah. did this two or three hours during the day. And the children absolutely loved it. And they yeah. didn't understand how peas were growing. They picked a load, with, left a patch for them to pick. They picked them all, put them in paper bags, went away, absolutely loved it. And I have to say, we got a number of very nicely written thank you letters. Oh, lovely. Very sweet, very mm. sweet.
Yeah. Oh, and I mean, there's nothing more satisfying than just picking some peas and just eating them straight. Up. They're so sweet. Aren't they? I mean, the ones I grow in my garden, I never actually get to cook with because the kids just go scrumping. Just... <laughs> That's it. Yeah, they will. They always speak like if you take them strawberry picking. I think these pick your own strawberry people. They think, well, we only they only pay for 50%. <laughs> That's why it's so expensive when you go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, um, well, I, I, think, I reckon I'm going to have to come and see um, the harvest in action. Because, again, I don't think I've ever seen a, a pea harvester. I've obviously watched Tractor Ted and watched, you know, uh, yeah. with, with, with the kids and things. So, But actually, yeah, just just seeing things in operation, it must be absolutely fascinating. Well, it is. And, you know, you're welcome to visit any time, really. At the moment, one of our tar so targets are mini projects within the promotional campaign is to actually do an animation of the peas all the way through you know the journey to the frozen coming out the freezer at the other end but that's not going to be cheap it's no. quite expensive to yeah, do yeah. um but it's good armory it's something you know you can have as the backstory that you can pull out every year because we we try and build all these assets which you mentioned cooking earlier so on the yespeas website which off the top of my head is peas.org there are an awful lot of recipes on there and something to suit everybody mm. some recipes that go with you know meat dishes or whatever um and the cuisines broad spectrum you know from the western culture to an eastern culture to an asian culture yeah. right across the board um vegetarianism um, there's even a christmas one on there as well which we have this yes peas uh young chef P, young pea chef of the year competition probably yeah. every two years and one of the children a number of years ago came up with peas in blankets for christmas so then peas within a bit of bacon and actually, it is very good. Yes. Um, so much so that uh, Bird's Eye, who we're all familiar with, put it on their website. For Amazing. To do. So it was good. I mean, that's always a fun thing to do, but we're probably doing that every two years now because you want to keep things fresh and don't yeah. get bored of us churning the same thing out. Yeah. And so how can people find out more information on FEMPs and the SPs campaign? You've obviously mentioned the website. Um... Yeah, well, we, we have a website. We've had a website for a number of years. And there's an awful lot of information on there about what we do, how we do it. And that's fempees.com. A hell of a lot of information on there. And also mm. on the front page, some of the things, like we did a piece with Country Father and other stuff, yeah. there are the film and the footage from that on there so people can understand it a bit more um, and as far as the ESPs campaign is concerned peas.org um, which is a it's a lovely looking website it um, does really catch the eye and there's so much information on there as to what we're up to what we're doing what we're doing for Great British Pea Week and these recipes I mean the recipes if somebody's looking for inspiration we've even you know we're coming into the summer fingers crossed yeah um, and there are summertime recipes like sprinkling peas within a salad, you know, yeah. just defrosting them and then sprinkling mm. them in a salad, just eating them raw, which is fine. Raw mm. peas are okay to eat, as we know with vegetables. But yeah, and there's a comments page on there if somebody wants to ask a question, whatever. But uh, yeah, we just like to engage with people as much as we can. And we're proud of our story. Everybody that's involved in the industry is. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it is incredible when you think there's a tiny pea seed we're putting in the ground to 120, 30,000 tonnes that the UK produces. And when it's in a packet, you think, yeah, that looks fairly easy. But yeah, there's a yeah. lot of hard work gone into it by many, many people. I mean, there's, you know, we talk about seeds, seed houses as well. You know, they've got to produce seed in other places of the world. So, you know, obviously when the war in Ukraine started last year, the movement of pea seed was affected greatly Yeah, uh, from the Southern Hemisphere. Obviously, we got affected by fuel and all sorts. So there are various things that affect us. COVID, interesting one, because obviously the service sector shut down overnight. Who mm. said no aeroplanes flying, um, no restaurants, blah, blah, blah. And so we thought, crikey, that's going to be it. But what happened? People cooked at home. Mm. 
And we actually found the demand went up and you had the likes of Jamie Oliver, Nigella Lawson coming on, telling people how they could cook simply and effectively. Mm. And we saw, you know, a significant increase in peas, but also frozen products in general as to yeah. people using the ingredients because some people unfortunately couldn't earn. So again, you know, whatever's happening in the world, whatever job anybody's in, it's always affecting you. You need to be aware of what's going on not just within our own shores, but world further yeah. away. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, all of those um, sites and everything I'll put on the show notes so people can find out more information as well. But, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. And I've talked to you about peas all day, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think. Well, I, I could probably talk about them all day and pull the pants <laughs> off you as well. <laughs> but, no, when you think that you've got a day you want to ride out, to come and mm. look at the pea harvest we i think we'll start harvesting around about the 12th of june and we go for seven weeks we would gladly see you and i mean you mentioned the award ceremony the other week it'd be nice some i don't know whether or not there could be a quick fix for the royal ag society you know just to come and it'd have to be a last minute job but yeah, yeah. if they're interested they can yeah, 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 definitely. Well, I definitely bear that in mind and pick up with you. Definitely amazing. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, here are some time saving hacks for you to try at home. I'm mixing it up this week. Instead of a time saving hack, I'm giving you a beautiful cake recipe that can be made both gluten free and dairy free if you wish. And the curveball ingredient is peas. I'll share the full recipe in the show notes for the lemon pea and honey cake, which uses no butter, but vegetable oil instead. And I've used gluten-free flour and baking powder, but you can easily use normal self-raising flour. And this was a recipe that Stephen sent to me from the Yes Peas campaign. It's absolutely beautiful. And I've already started sharing um, pictures on social media. Um, It was a joy to blend peas and use as an ingredient as part of that recipe and basically it's so simple you just combine all of the ingredients bake for 20 to 25 minutes mine took around 25 minutes in my ever hot and then I iced it and made it look really pretty so I'll definitely share that one with everybody and in season right now July of course it's peas but of course French beans main crop potatoes broad beans tomatoes yum all of these, all of this produce is packed full of goodness and grown here in the British Isles. A go-to summer recipe of mine is a bacon cheese and pea quiche. I always use ready roll pastry. It is quick, easy and no fuss. And I always think of a quiche as a posh pizza, <laughs> but uses up some tasty eggs as well as some fried bacon lardons, onions, peas and cheddar cheese. And again, I will share that recipe with you in the show notes. How does that sound, Stephen? Do these wet your appetite? I'm I'm salivating. I'm (laughs) salivating. One thing that you, you know, they're absolutely delicious. They really are. But the other thing which people don't think, you know, peas, they tend to think middle of the day, end of the day. But one of the things, and we talked about, touched on sustainability earlier, is pea mash, which sounds terrible, but crushed mashed peas on toast for breakfast with a little bit of salt absolutely fantastic and we all know that while i don't want to diss them avocados take an awful lot of water and are not really so sustainable in this day and age with flying all over the world but for anybody that is very conscious about what they're eating in terms of that try pea mash the recipe is on the sp's website oh that is such a good hack as well because it's so quick and simple and like you say sustainable as well and that's what you know what this is what this podcast is all about really it's sort of highlighting what is grown in this country and inspirational ideas for recipe suggestions and uh knowing where your food comes from so yeah brilliant thank you okay that's all we've got time for today don't forget to tune into the next episode of the countryside kitchen meets on the first of each month You can subscribe on all major podcast streaming platforms and get in touch. Would you like to be on a future episode? How about sponsoring a future episode? Because it does cost me a little bit of money to um, create this podcast and get it out there into the big wide world. And obviously there's a quite a good return on investment in terms of um, promotional. So if you're a company listening and would be interested, drop me a line. Um, My email is hello at millie5.com. 
And of course, you can follow my food blog, No Fest Meals for Busy Parents, on Facebook, Instagram, and www.nofestmealsforbusyparents.com for top tips, time saving hacks, and some recipe ideas. Thank you so much, Stephen, for joining me. I've so enjoyed learning more about peas, and I will definitely be taking you up on your offer of seeing the pea harvest. Excellent. We look forward to seeing you. It's been a pleasure, Mary. Thank you so much. Keep up the amazing work. See you next time. Bye. Cheers. Bye.